Well, thank you so much for joining us for today's webinar, Can We Starve Ourselves to Better Health and Longer Life? I'm Greg Berry, Director of Communications in the Office of Alumni Affairs. Since we're coming to you virtually, please excuse technical issues or glitches that may pop up. Have an issue with video or audio? Click the reconnect button to get back to the webinar quickly. And just a heads up, we are recording today's webinar. A replay will be uploaded onto our website by tomorrow. Also, have a question for our guests? Toss it in the chat. We'll have time for Q&A at the end of the presentation. At this time, I'd like to introduce that guest, Dr. Stephen Osted. Dr. Osted earned a BA in English Literature from UCLA, BS in Biology from Cal State Northridge, and was awarded his PhD in Biology from Purdue. He is the Distinguished Professor and Chair of the Department of Biology here at UAB and is the Founding Director of the UAB Nathan Schock Center for Excellence in the Basic Biology of aging. At this time, Dr. Osted, welcome back to our webinar series. It's great to have you, and I'm going to turn the presentation over to you. Thanks a lot, Greg. It's, it's great to be back, and I always look forward to talking to UAB alumni. And today I want to talk about how eating less could benefit your health. And I'd like to start off with a little historical perspective. The first person who actually made this link between eating less and living longer was Luigi Canero more than uh, 500 years ago, who wrote a book called The Art of Living Long. And you can see what he had to say. I've put a, a quote at the bottom there that's kind of the bottom line of the book. He, whoever wishes to eat much must eat little, which simply means that the eating of a little lengthens a man's life and by living a long time, he is enabled to eat a great deal. Now, Luigi actually was in poor health until about the age of four. He lived a dissipated life uh, at about the age of 40. He didn't think he would live much longer. Reading his book with modern eyes, we can tell that uh, one of the main health problems he had was uh, diabetes. And from that time forward, he went on a, a diet that consisted of about a thousand calories a day, as far as I can uh, tell. Now, we don't know how tall he was or how thin he was. But his book had a special, I would guess, a, a special uh, message, a special weight, because if you look at his birth and death dates here, um, you can see that he lived 109 years, which is by Renaissance standards, which is remarkable. In fact, even today with all our medical advances, only about one person in a million lives that long. Uh, he was so successful at uh, living longer that it was actually became somewhat suspect. And a journalist named Greg Kreitzer actually noticed that each new edition of his book, his birth date got earlier and earlier and earlier. And Greg eventually decided to go to Pisa and investigate a little and found out that, um, that in fact, uh, Cornero was born quite a bit later. Uh, than he originally said. But in, indeed, he lived to the age of 87, which for Renaissance Italy uh, was not too bad. I have to say, though, about a third of the calories that he reports eating came from the wine uh, that he drank every day. Now, uh, flash forward to the 1930s when Clive McKay, who's a veterinarian at Cornell, discovered something that I call the rodent dietary restriction effect. And that was simply this. Um, if you feed a rat or a mouse 30 to 40% less than it would eat if you gave it all the food it wanted, it lives somewhere between 20 and 40% longer than it normally would. And that graph there is just showing that dotted line is when half of the animals are dead. And you can see for the controls that it's about 40 months and for the ones that are eating less, it's, uh, it's you know, 55 months. And those black dots at the bottom are the age at which the controls got cancer and the open circles are when the restriction got cancer. It's not just that the animals are living longer, but they're staying healthy longer. And in fact, this is really grippingly shown in a slide I'll show next. First, I want to just tell you how this is done, because when we come about how this might translate to people, it's important to know how it's done in rodents. So the way it's done, is that rodents who live in these shoebox sized cages have all the food they could possibly eat, have excess food available to them all the time. 
And we typically use uh, rodents that are all genetically identical to them. And what we'll do is we'll track for an amount of time, several weeks, how much they're eating. And we'll take another group and we'll feed them 30 to 40% less than that. That's how this research is done. Now, the remarkable effect is that it slows aging and preserves function in just about every way that we can imagine. I'm just gonna just show one figure of that here, which is if you put a running wheel in their cage, you'll notice in the black diamonds there that the ones that are eating all they want run about a kilometer a night. They're young, but by the time they're old, they're hardly running at all. Now that might be smart considering they don't have any anywhere to run to except around in a soul. But notice that the animals that are restricted start off running five kilometers or more a night, and in fact are still running you know, more than a kilometer at ages that all of the ones that were ad-lib fed have died. So that just shows how remarkable this uh, dietary restriction effect is. Now, how do we translate that to humans? This has been a continuing problem. And there's two possibilities here. One possibility is shown on the left, that what we're basically doing is that we have obese laboratory rats and mice, and by restricting their diet, we're reducing them to a healthy body weight. Or in the other case, maybe our laboratory mice are at a healthy body weight, and we're reducing them to some extreme emaciation, as you can see on the right there. And we still don't really know which of these is actually represents what we're doing with our rodents. And I'm one of the few people in the field who actually has ever been a field biologist. So I've actually gone out into the field and said, well, how much fat, how fat are field mice compared to our laboratory mice? And then what if we take our mice from the nature and we bring them into the lab and we feed them all that they want, how fat do they become? And one of the things that you can see there is that the laboratory mice are nearly twice as big as the mice that came from the field. And they have more body fat, considerably more body fat than either the wild mice kept in the lab, which is the wild derived ones, or the wild mice themselves. So it's quite possible that what we're really doing is taking mice that are relatively obese and reducing them to a healthy body weight. Um, that's something that typically isn't taken into consideration in these studies. Well, let's move on and talk about humans and primates and see how um, this dietary restriction affects them. The first human study that was done like this was done uh, by this fellow here in the upper left. His name is Roy Walford, one of the more interesting people that you'll ever run into in your life. And, and how interesting was Roy? When he was a medical student, he and a colleague uh, just went to Las Vegas over spring break and from watching a roulette wheel, figured out that there was an imperfection in the roulette wheel, which made it uh, more prone to come up on certain numbers. And they used their spring vacation to win a bunch of money, which they went, then bought a yacht with. Neither of them had ever sailed before and they sailed their new yacht to uh, Cuba. So that's the kind of guy uh, that Roy was. And this Biosphere 2, I show a picture of it here. It was a weird idea that you could build this self-contained ecosystem, Biosphere 1 would be the Earth, and that people could live in that for uh, several years without any, uh, anything coming in from the outside or anything from the inside going out. It was an experiment that had, I'm not sure, it had something to do with space flight, long-term space flight. Um, but Roy had been studying dietary restriction in mice for years. Here's a picture, by the way, of the biospherians, as they like to call themselves, uh, just about at the time they went into the biosphere. And the diet they... Uh, had for themselves was really a, a wonderful diet. I just show you some of the ingredients here. And they had to grow all their own food. So they really were attempting to be self-contained. Initially, uh, they were eating about 21 calories a day. Um, but it turns out that these eight academics were not all that great of farmers and they couldn't really produce as much food as they needed to 
So they ended up, Roy was ecstatic about this because he had been restricting his own diet for years and always wanted to do a human dietary restriction experiment. And here he had it right in front of him. So they reduced their caloric intake to 1,750 calories a day. They did it in a, in a strange way. Uh, everybody got that, didn't matter what your size was. So there were some of the people in there that weighed over 200 pounds and some of the people were 100 pounds, the women particularly, but they all got 1,750 calories. Now, um, that picture that you're seeing there of them in the, in the rafters, when they came out, of the rafters, uh, they had another picture like that. In fact, they had a picture going in like this, only the people were naked, uh, and I've spared you that picture. And Roy showed another picture of them coming out when they were also naked. And I wanted to use those two pictures in a book I was writing at the time, and I asked Roy if I could do that. And he said, well, I can't really let you do that because everything is under litigation. It turns out that, uh, two years of uh, calorie restriction had uh, provided enough stress that people came out of there uh, hating one another. And so they were suing one another right and left. But it turns out that of the few things they looked at in terms of their health, they looked at their blood pressure, they looked at their blood glucose, every change that they had seen in the biosphere was a change that indicated better health. So Roy came out absolutely convinced that um, this was the key to living a longer, healthier life. Now, Roy actually only lived about another decade after this. He was the oldest person going in, and he ended up um, dying of a, of, a, of a disease that was very similar to Lou Gehrig's disease. And he attributed it, though, to the atmosphere in the biosphere because they weren't really self-sustaining sustaining like they thought. And in fact, the oxygen levels in there had dropped lower and lower. And by the time they noticed that they were living at the equivalent of 17,000 feet in the biosphere. So he thought that that uh, was responsible for the disease that eventually killed him. Now, let me just digress here uh, into body mass index to, to give us uh, a sort of frame of reference for what I'm going to talk about from now on. This is something that the World Health Organization has classified. These are not hard and fast um, uh, rules, but body mass index is simply a, a way to measure how much you weigh as a function of how tall you are. And so-called normal weight is between about 18 and a half and 25 uh, BMI, as they call it. Overweight is 25, 30, obese 30 to 35, et cetera. And, and again, on an individual level, this doesn't tell you much, but on a population level, it sort of gives you an idea of how thin or otherwise uh, populations are. So let's look at Roy before and after. Roy went into the biosphere with a BMI of 22.1, which is just about the middle of, of regular. Uh, mono obese, you know, what's called a healthy body weight. And he came out at 17.6. And uh, you can see he doesn't look too happy there when he came out, but he told me that he never felt better in his life. And he was doing tons and tons of work. And everybody that I show this to seems to agree that Roy didn't, despite how healthy he looked, uh, he didn't really, I mean, I, he felt he didn't really, uh, look that healthy, and I would have to agree. Now, that was an uncontrolled study. That was an accidental study. But since then, the National Institute on Aging has funded a number of studies, both in primates, non-human primates, and in humans trying to see if the almost miraculous health benefits of what we see in rodents can be translated to humans. And they did one series of studies called calorie studies. Calorie is an acronym and I forget what it stands for, but here they actually did a proper clinical trial. They randomized people to either be controlled, which they called healthy eating, or to be in one of the dietary groups. They did it at three different places at the same time. And each of these places, they wanted to target about a 20 to 25% calorie restriction. And they wanted to do that in the first study, it was for six months and in the second study for two years. Now, those of you who ever tried to diet over the long term realize that that's difficult to do. 
And even with all of the coaching and food that was being given to them, it turned out that people couldn't achieve that 20 to 25 percent calorie restriction over month after month. They actually achieved about 11 or 12 percent. And when they did that, there were modest improvements in a number of health indicators. They had, they had better uh, numbers for blood pressure, cholesterol, blood glucose, um, insulin, a whole variety of things. Um, but the one thing it did show is that even people that were, were highly motivated that were being paid to be in the study couldn't really do it. And also, uh, we weren't really getting the sort of extreme emaciation that the people in the biosphere were subjecting themselves to and what they thought the rodent data suggested. So you can see here in the healthy eating group, this is just from one of the sites. The BMI that they started with was slightly overweight. Uh, in one of the groups that they combined uh, food restriction and exercise, it dropped to right there at the border of sort of overweight and normal weight. And even the restricted groups were still kind of in the middle of normal. So they really weren't restricting to the degree that most people thought that rodents were being restricted. Which brings us to the cronies. Now the cronies, uh, crony stands for calorie restriction with optimal nutrition. And there was a group called the Calorie Restriction Society, a, a group of about a couple thousand people worldwide who believed so uh, fervently in the rodent data that they decided that they were going to restrict their own diets substantially and, and do it, did it for a long time. And here you can see one of the cronies uh, with his girlfriend, that's Michael Ray, with his girlfriend, April. And Michael, as you can see, is very, very lean himself. In fact, I got invited to um, an international meeting of the cronies one time. And um, Michael sat down next to me at dinner one time, and he had a big pile of lettuce and seeds and vegetables. And I thought I would make a joke. And I said, Michael, you're not really gonna eat all that, are you? And no kidding, he took a balance out of his bag and he put his food on it. He weighed it and he said, and he got his calculator out and he calculated, he said 357 calories. Yes, I am going to eat it. Well, the, the cronies are actually doing something that's probably the closest thing of, that, that's been done to the rodent restriction uh, studies. Um, the trouble is who do you compare them to? Well, these are people that probably didn't have normal eating habits or normal health habits before they started doing this. Um, they did it all kinds of different ways. Some of them restricted only a protein. Some of them restricted carbohydrates. Uh, some of them exercised. Some of them didn't. Most of them didn't exercise as well, actually, because exercise makes you hungry and they didn't want to be hungry. It would make it more difficult to stay on the diet. And as a consequence, they had a real problem keeping on any muscle mass. And I was in a TV show on the BBC with one of these people a number of years ago, and they wanted to have a photo of him. They, they basically had given him a, a complete physical exam, and they wanted to have a photo, a video of him doing some activity. So they said, well, what about if we have you swim across the pool? And so um, he, he went in the water, and by golly, he just about drowned because he had no body fat. So it was like dropping an anvil into the water. And he also had no muscles, so he couldn't swim very well. He finally splashed across the pool. Now, one of the things that um, they, they found out from giving him this uh, um, examination, it is cardiovascular risk factors look wonderful. On the other hand, his bones, and this was a guy that was probably 45 years old, his bones look like the bones of a woman in her 70s. So it wasn't good for his bone health. And then, as I say, uh, his uh, 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 muscles were gone. And the last thing is they couldn't find any testosterone in his blood. He didn't want them to mention that on the air, and so they didn't. Um, but it is possible to compare the cronies to people who are lean but got there by different mechanisms. So um, this fellow, uh, Luigi uh, Fontana, compared the cronies with vegans 
uh, who had been vegan for at least two years, and most of them, as you can see, had been vegans for longer than that, with people who are lean because they were endurance runners. They averaged about 50 miles of running a week, so substantial running, and have been doing it for a, for a couple of decades on average. And then they compared them to just people off the street in St. Louis, which is where this was done. And as you can see, they were all people around 50. And here's really what they found. They I'm highlighted the three groups, the cronies, and I'm only gonna show you their cholesterol counts. Uh, if we looked at blood pressure and other things, it's quite similar. Um, first of all, their cholesterol was all excellent, you know, around 140 to 160. Uh, their LDL was very low, which is what you want. That's the so-called bad cholesterol. You can see how much lower it is than the controls. And their good cholesterol, the HDL cholesterol, is also high, very high, considerably higher. So there's really doesn't seem to be, in the cronies at least, a huge physiological advantage in at least these cardiovascular risk factors under people who are lean uh, by other mechanisms. Now, it turns out that for the last 30 plus years, the National Institute on Aging has also been funding uh, two studies of dietary restriction in monkeys. And the advantage of doing it in monkeys over people is that the monkeys will eat what you tell them to eat because that's all the food you give them, so they have no choice. The interesting feature of this study is that they came to very different results. At the University of Wisconsin, they found a really robust effect, increased longevity, better blood glucose, all kinds of health advantages of the animals that were restricted. And these were restricted by um, 30% um, compared to their controls. At the National Institute on Aging, by contrast, they found no impact at all on how long they live. Absolutely none. There were some health benefits. It looked like their glucose control was a bit better, but really these were really very opposite results. And once the two studies started talking to each other, it turns out that the reason they got those very different results is because of how they treated the animals that there were control animals. At the University of Wisconsin, Control animals were like the rats and mice, those that had food available to them all the time. And as you can see in the upper right there, they got to be fairly obese. And when they were restricted by 30%, as you can see on the left, they had a healthy body weight. The National Institute on Aging did it somewhat differently. Their control animals were fed an amount that they felt kept them at a healthy body weight. And their restricted animals were and so the take-home message from that is that it looks like it's the maintenance of a healthy body weight that seems to be important at getting the dietary restriction amounts, at least from these two studies, that restricting from a healthy body weight may not offer any advantages. So, oops. Let me just conclude what we found so far. There's some similarities and some differences of the human and the primate studies compared to rodents. Um, from what we know now, it may not be better than improving other lifestyle uh, factors and might be easier to exercise than to eat 30% less than you'd like to. But I think the main take home uh, message is that no matter what, humans simply cannot do that rodent style. Even even the people in the biosphere that were ideologically committed to these people, to, to this, could not maintain that kind of caloric intake chronically for week after week, month after month, year after year. The people in the cronies, that they're, they're an unusual group. There are people that, my thought is, they probably didn't like to eat anyway, but we can't do that. And so where do we go from here in the dietary restriction? Well, it turns out that there was a real breakthrough made about 15 years ago by this fellow, Jay Mitchell, uh, who's at Hartford, and he at Harvard. Now, Jay wanted to see if the dietary restriction could help mice recover from surgery. So he did this type of surgery where 
he tied off the arteries that, that fed the kidneys for a certain amount of time, and then he removed the clamp, let the blood flow again, and when he did that, he looked at how, how well they recovered from that surgery. And he did that by restricting the animals 30%, but he also added something else. Now, if you look at the left there, this shows the, how the animals survived if they either fed ad lib, and you can see that in this case, uh, only 40% of them were alive a week after the surgery was done. Uh, but if he fast, if he put them on dietary restriction for a month, or simply put them on a three day water only fast, they survived perfectly well, none died. And he then thought, well, I wonder if I made this an even more rigorous challenge. So he removed one kidney and then clamped the other one off. And, what he, and then he added some more fasting regimes in here. And as you can see in the, on the right there, 90% uh, of the ad lib fed animals died within a week. Uh, for a one day fast, only 10% died. And the two or three day fasted animals actually did as well as animals that were dietarily restricted for a month or for two weeks. And this opened up a whole new avenue because we, those of us in the field went back to think about, well, how do we do these dietary restriction experiments in mice anyway? And I can tell you having done many of them that for the animals that are restricted, when you go in every day with your food, they are, they are doing pull-ups on the cage bars waiting for their food and they gobble it down really within minutes. And so in reality, what we're doing is we're not only restricting their calories, but we're making them fast for over 23 hours. And some of the ways that they do DR, they only fed them every other day. Or when they, the ones that were only getting fed every other day when they got fed, they gobbled their food down as well. And so we suddenly thought, well, maybe it's not the absolute amount of food intake, but maybe it's the period of fasting that's the important thing. And we know that fasting alters physiology within hours, within eight hours of eating. And so a new paradigm arose, which is maybe short-term fasting is the key thing that benefits health. And uh, not long after that, a researcher from Southern California thought, well, I wonder if short-term fasting, which is uh, good for um, um, surviving surgery, at least if you're a mouse, if that would also help mice recover from uh, a chemotherapeutic regime. So he put a couple of different types of mice, and I've just got two different mice here in terms of their genetics uh, on this chemotherapeutic agent. And you can see that the ones that were getting the chemotherapy, about half of the ones, half of them died within 20 days. But for the ones that had fasted for two days before they got the calorie restriction, they, I mean, before they got the chemotherapeutic drug, they survived much better. And, and Walter Alongo, who did this study, has gone on to actually do small studies in people that were on a calorie short-term fasting and ask them about the side effects that they got after um, chemotherapy. And in fact, they're reporting uh, lower side effects. Now, the huge advantage is that we've now discovered if this, if we can get many or most or all of the benefits of dietary restriction by these short-term fasting regimes, then that's something that people can actually do. People don't have any problem fasting, let's say for a day. And this has led to all of these new diets. There's time-restricted eating, which means that you get all your food and restrict, you eat all you want but you only eat in certain hours in the day. And then there's the 5-2 diet, which is a five-day eat all you want, two-day fast. There's a fast mimicking diet, which is just a very uh, low uh, uh, protein diet. There's alternate day fasting, there's short-term fasting, there's protein restriction. All of these things are now being examined in people. And what it, what's new about them is, like I say, these are things that people can actually do. Now, what do we know about all these new diets? Well, one thing we know is they seem to all be a very good way to, to lose weight. Uh, and if you're diabetic, 
they seem to be, if you have type 2 diabetes, they seem to be a pretty good way to get your blood glucose under control. Now, all the other advantages of dietary restriction, the resistance to cancer, the resistance to dementia, the resistance to heart disease, we really don't know. It's, it's too early. But I'd like to finish up by just pointing out that here at UAB, um, there is a person, Dr. Courtney Peterson, who's in the Department of Nutrition Scientists, who is currently doing a study of time-restricted eating, this 16-8. So eat all you want for eight hours a day, but then fast for 16 hours. And she's looking for recruits to take part in her study. And I just thought there might be somebody listening to this that might be interested in uh, participating in that study. Uh, you have to be between 25 and 45 years old. You have to have a body mass index between 22 and 30. And you have to be healthy. And I, I put here in parentheses, not too healthy, because she, if you're exercising too much, she really doesn't want you in the study. If you're exercising vigorously for 30 minutes or more a day for six days a week, um, then you're too healthy probably to be in her study. But here's the contact information for an email. So if you're interested in participating in the study, uh, it, it might be fun. Uh, you get paid a little bit of money and you really are contributing uh, to science. So I think I used just about the time allotted to me. I wanted to, uh, my agent would kill me if I didn't plug my latest book that came out about a year ago, which is about a different aspect of aging, but one that I think uh, that you might find entertaining. And I've included a bunch of blurbs uh, from my parents under various pseudonyms, but some nice things that people have said about it. So thanks for your attention. I'm happy to answer any questions that you might have. Yeah, thank you so much for the information that Prof said. Um, let's just start from the bottom. So is there a correlation between withholding and restricting food and living longer, but it is because of a physiological survival mechanism? I'm sorry, you, you kind of faded out at the, the last few words of the sentence. Yeah, I was getting feedback on my, uh, <laughs> so I apologize. Um, is there a correlation okay. between withholding and restricting food and living longer, but is it because of the physiological survival mechanism bodies adjust to? Yeah, well, I mean, we, it's, it's so funny. We've been studying uh, dietary restriction in rodents since the 1930s, and we still really don't know how it works. It's almost embarrassing. And, and, and part of the reason is that uh, simply eating less or fasting changes so many aspects of physiology that has been virtually impossible to identify one key thing. It's probably, it's probably complex. If it was simple, if it was one thing, we no doubt would have figured it out by now. How did they get the I animals or the meat um, that the people ate in the biosphere? Was it, it so that was the first part of the question, it's a two-parter. How did they get them the food, the meat, the animals? The, the, animals, and yeah. the litigation was the litigation settled before settled? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, that very good questions. Well, they, they took animals in with them and they were breeding animals and they were eating the animals that they took in with them. And, uh, but they had to do it in a sustainable fashion because they really couldn't eat anything. And, you know, I never found out what happened to the litigation. I forgot to mention this. Is interesting. So day after tomorrow, I was invited out to the University of Arizona to give a talk to their graduate students and postdocs um, for their annual retreat. And you know where their annual retreat is gonna be? It's gonna be in the biosphere too. So I've been lecturing about this for decades and I've never actually seen it in person or been in it in person. And now I'm gonna give a lecture in it. So I'm really quite excited about that. Uh, that is awesome. Well, I can't wait to see the picture. Uh, from that. Um, so this person says that they imagine there's a lot of overlap or they imagine there was a lot of overlap with the eating disorder population. Is, is that true? And that goes back to what you were talking about just a little bit ago. Yeah, I, you know, uh, physicians that I've talked to about the cronies have said if they came into my clinic, I would send them for a, a eating disorder uh, consult. Um, 
And so there is there is that danger. This is one. This is one of the nice things about the new paradigms, which are really focused on fasting for a certain amount of times and not necessarily on dieting all the time. So I actually think there are many, many advantages. And if it turns out that there are really health advantages beyond what we would simply expect from reducing obesity, this is really going to be uh, quite exciting. And, and of course, there are massive numbers of people now doing this on their own. I actually discovered that I'm doing time-restricted feeding, not because of any of this, but because of my normal life. I if given up breakfast and I eat a kind of a mid morning and a, and a evening meal and that's it. So I'm almost in the 16 8 restriction uh, just because of my academic life. What did they contribute to the crony that did not have any testosterone? Well, I mean, you, you know, cholesterol is a, is a precursor of testosterone and it could be that, that, people eating as little as they were, and especially depending on what you were restricting. Um, I actually, the two people uh, that I showed you the picture of, uh, Michael and his girlfriend, April there, the cronies. That, so the other thing I didn't mention was uh, side effect was reduced libido, which loss of interest in sex. And so I made the mistake of asking um, Michael if that was a side effect that he had encountered. and. April for asking the question, so I never got a straight answer out of him. So that is another consideration with that kind of extreme dietary restriction. I had heard nothing like that with any of the new, you know, short-term fast diets. I've heard nothing about reduced testosterone or uh, loss of libido or any of those side effects. Any data on the comparison of testosterone levels for the vegans and runners? Um, no, you know, it, it, that's pretty interesting. I, he did not do it in that study, and uh, that would be very interesting. In fact, um, he probably has stored blood samples from those. I, I almost can, it's an interesting question. I'm almost going to ask him if he might run those analyses because it would be interesting. I'm going to toss the slide back there. People are asking about that, so we want to be able to get those the information that they want. So are you familiar with the French study of mouse lemurs at all? Yeah, I am. Comparable? Um, well, those are very unusual. You know, they, they, those mouse, so France is one of the few, only country in the world that could do this. There are these mouse lemurs in, in, in France that they use for aging studies and they even get a kind of Alzheimer's disease, a form of Alzheimer's disease. But what they've done is accelerated their aging by changing their photo period. In other words, they give them, you know, 20 hour days rather than 24 hour days. And that seems to make them uh, accelerate their aging. And when they restrict their diet, they do uh, live longer and stay healthy longer. Uh, like any of these studies, you'd like to see it repeated. You know, uh, one of the things I liked about the calorie study and the primate study is that it was done in more than a single place. But lemurs, you can't do that for because they're endangered species and you can't, uh, you can't introduce them into new uh, countries and new facilities for research, unfortunately. So which meal of the day, which meal of the day should we eat more of? Should the meals differ in the amounts? Yeah, there's all this conventional wisdom that breakfast is mo the most important meal of the day and all. I, there's virtually no empirical evidence to support that. I think the key thing is uh, how much to eat and the timing of what you eat. One of the things that nobody's asked me about with my head there was, well, does it matter what you restrict? What, do you restrict protein? Do you restrict fat? Do you restrict carbohydrate? Uh, and for the longest time, uh, the science said doesn't matter what you restrict, you get the same effect. But more recently, people have looked at it more carefully. And it seems to be that it, at least in terms of cancer prevention, that restricting protein seems to give the most similarities to the, to the rodent studies. Does coffee with milk break my fast in the morning? I... <laughs> 
this is the same issue that I faced because I do recommend it, it kind of does. <laughs> so, so you're kind of doing time restricted eating. And I, I don't know for uh, Dr. Peterson's study if they allow that coffee with milk in the morning or not. I'd be curious to know. It seems that while cardiac markers were improved in many studies, are these given more weight than other health markers such as osteoporosis, loss of muscle, muscle mass? How does one determine which markers are more important for any person's healthy life? Yes, well, it depends on who's doing the study. That's a very good point. We tend to focus on cardiovascular diseases because that's the number one killer of humans. Um, and we tend to focus on fatal diseases, but there are also life quality aspects. And I think the low bone density is something that we don't take seriously enough, particularly if you combine low bone density with low muscle mass, then you're talking about a recipe for falls. And as people get uh, further along in life, and that can be not only fatal, you know, some one out of five people that, that, that breaks something in a fall dies within a year, um, but it can also decrease the quality of life if, if you have collapsing vertebrae. So I don't think we really pay attention enough to things that affect the quality of life. We're more focused on things that we die from, and maybe we're, we don't have our balance correct in that. Are the effects of time-restricted diet consistent regardless of the fasting time frame, say 12-12, 14-12, 16-8? Yeah, we, we, this is too new. We don't know enough of, of, about this yet. And it's, you know, it's hard to recruit people for these, these studies because you're asking people to do something very different uh, than they normally do. Most of them have been short term, you know, weeks or months. What we'd really like to have is people that have been doing this uh, for years. And uh, certainly we won't have that for a long time. And we're probably never going to have a controlled study of that, which is unfortunate because as I think, look at things like cancer prevention, for instance, you really do need people that are on this, these diets for, for years, not just, not just months. Are there any books regarding fasting that you would recommend for providers counseling patients on weight loss? And are there any online resources that could direct patients to? Ah, uh, that is a good question. You know, the, the, the person that I find that is familiar with all of this literature that has the most sober, I, I think, and realistic view of it is a physician named Peter Atia, A-T-T-I-A. -A. Uh, he had a book come out recently called At Live, Out Live, sorry, um, that I highly recommend. And, um, you know, you know, dealing with patients is, is, is difficult, but he's actually got a lot in that book about how he deals with patients. Now, he has, you know, what he calls his, his longevity clinic. So he tends to get more people interested in longevity than normal. But I really recommend his book. I've, he's got a podcast also that I recommend. I've done it a couple of times, and he's, he, he really asks incisive questions. I did drop a link to that. We are not endorsing Amazon or anything. It's just easy to Google Amazon and put that on there. So if you're interested in that book, find it in the chat. Is listening to your body and eating when you're feeling hungry better than eating at a fixed schedule, you know, of the usual morning, lunch, dinner time? I would say no. Uh, you know, our bodies developed over thousands and thousands of years when food particularly high calorie food, was very hard to come by. I used to work uh, in the field in Papua New Guinea in a very remote area where people were living pretty much stone age lives. For them, eating when their body told them to was a good idea because their body was telling them to eat anytime they could get enough food. But I think that our food cravings arose at a time when calories were hard to come by. And now calories are our food cravings will often lead us to um, to overeating, especially the kind of food that we have now, which is really high calorie dense foods. Have the impacts of caloric restriction and time restriction feeding 
all been positive or does it depend on the dietary components being restricted? Uh, again, I'd say it's, it's, it's too early. Certainly all these things you worry about unwanted side effects, right? Like for the, for the cronies that it was low muscle mass, you know, low bone density. Um, there's also an issue, some of the, some of the rodent studies show um, some immunosuppression with uh, reduced, uh, with dietary restriction as well. The cronies don't report that. And so I'm quite convinced that that's not an issue for humans because the cronies are so attentive to their health that they would know if they were getting more, let's say respiratory diseases or something. And they told me, we don't ever get colds. We don't ever get any of these other things. However, I wonder how they fared during the COVID pandemic. I'd be curious uh, to know that. So uh, I don't think we know enough to, 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 to recommend the composition uh, of the diet. That's something that we need more information on. We need more studies. What is the required time frame for all of this to be sustainable and how do we avoid having the opposite of the intended effect? Um, the opposite being overeating because you've been fasting. Well, I mean, this is one of the interesting things about these, these diets is that on the days when you're eating and or the times of day that you're eating, you can eat all you want. And it just seems that your body naturally, when you restrict it, your body naturally goes into this fasting state. And that fasting state seems to be associated with, with weight loss. Now, I don't know if people that were already, you know, exceptionally thin went on time-restricted eating, whether they would lose weight or not, but it seems to be the one really consistent effect. And for most of us, you know, losing a few pounds is not the worst thing in the world anyway. Are telomeres extended by fasting? No, no it's, uh, so it's interesting. Uh, t telomeres, if you go to aging meetings these days, um, you, you don't hear anything about telomeres. They, they sort of came and they went. They're still very big in the, in the um, cancer field, but in the aging field, um, they haven't turned out to be very predictive of virtually anything. It's not that hard to find a 70-year-old that has telomere lengths of a 25-year-old. They're very variable. And so that's one of those things that at least in the biology of aging has it looked very promising initially, but hasn't really panned out. Biology of cancer, it's a different story. If somebody has a condition in which certain food groups should be restricted, this is a three-part question. How do they balance this with restricting calories in a healthy manner? Well, it depends on what they need to be, what they need to be restricted on. There are some studies, um, I actually, one doing one in my lab now where people restrict just a single amino acid we're restricting methionine in in my lab uh to look at the effect there's been a fairly consistent increase in longevity in rodents and in other experimental species that have had just that one amino acid uh restricted methionine so it, it really would depend on i guess the nature of the of the Restriction, my guess is this probably has something to do with uh, with uh, inflammatory bowel disease or something, in which case you want to avoid gluten. Um, and in that case, though, there's many other sources of carbohydrates. So I don't think that that's a, a big problem. I'll combine the last two questions together. Does this all affect what foods would be considered nutrition while also being calorie friendly, or does it depend on a portion size and components that may contribute to the higher calorie amounts, such as saturated fat, cholesterol, added sugars? Yeah, well, from what we know now, um, I mean, we, we know that there are downsides to, to, to all of those things if you eat a lot of them. What we don't know is if those downsides might be compensated for with this, um, with the with the periods of fasting you, that you might go on. Certainly, uh, you know, avoiding those components of your diet if you eat a normal diet are something that we would want to do. On the other hand, we don't know if this time restricted eating might overcome some of the detrimental effects of those uh, things in the diet. 
is there an association between caloric restriction and oxidative stress damage? Oh, yes. Yes, actually, this is some work that I did uh, um, a number of years ago that um, dietary restriction decreases uh, oxidative damage substantially in every way uh, that we can measure it. And it doesn't do it so much by increasing the level level of antioxidants in the body, but it does it by reducing the amount of uh, reactive oxygen species that are produced. I'm going to drop a link, Dr. Peterson, since she's still on our screen there. We did a webinar with her a, a while back about intermittent fasting. I invite people to take a look at that as well. Dr. Ostad, it's been an incredible pleasure hosting you again on our webinar series, and it's been great information. We've had a very engaged audience. so. Appreciate you taking time out of your busy schedule to be a part of this this, this afternoon. Well, thanks, Greg. It was it was fun to do, and I love doing it. So anytime. You are Thank welcome you. back anytime you'd like. So and a quick reminder to everybody, we plan to upload a replay of this webinar onto our website by tomorrow. As an attendee, you will receive an email once the link is ready. In a moment, we're going to highlight a few upcoming webinars that we have scheduled. But first, join us for Uncork Education as part of Homecoming Week. I'll just tell you about this. Apparently, I didn't prepare the slide for this. Uh, it's on November 2nd. This year, Uncork will feature Blazer Plinko, Collapse of Bounce, a live and silent auction, wine and beer tasting, and Old Fashions and Manhattans by Mercy Craft Spirits. Join us as we support student scholarships. Register for our in-person event at uh, alumni.uab.edu slash uncork2023. The cost is just $60 per person. If you just want to bid, it's free, but go ahead and visit us. And as promised, I'll talk about these four that are on the screen. On Tuesday, October 10th, come back as we explore alumni travel through our partnership with Colette. Find out more about Memorials of World War II, a sold out trip that we do have 16 seats available. A train trip through the Canadian Rockies, a European vacation through Switzerland, Austria, and Bavaria are the other two. On Tuesday, October 17th, join us for Head Over Meals, Weight Management Strategies from Behavioral Medicine. Dr. Megan Hayes returns to examine strategies on how we can improve our weight management. On Thursday, October 26th, we'll welcome verified content creator Joshua Darren for Haunting History, the reality of urban legends as we explore paranormal history in Birmingham and the South. And on Thursday, November 9th, join us for An Economist Goes Shopping, Black Friday Holidays and the Current Economic climate. Dr. Benjamin Meadows will walk us through the current state of spending and what it means for 2023. You can register for these and more at alumni.uab.edu slash events. Finally, we'd love to get your feedback on what you thought about today's webinar. The QR code on your screen takes you to a short survey. Share your thoughts. Let us know how we're doing. Let us know what you'd like to see. Once again, thank you so much for joining us for today's webinar. And as always, go Blazers.